So actually, uh, Ellen set up very nicely what I'm going to talk about, which is some of the more philosophical, um, existential, moral issues surrounding this stuff. Um, and um, I apologize also to Ellen for this quote kind of menacingly sitting over her shoulder during the end there. Um, <laughs> But I'm actually going to return to that quote in a second. I just thought it would be a good uh, sort of provocative thing to start with. Um, and what I'm going to focus on is this question that comes up a lot, not just with CRISPR, but also with all kinds of biotechnology. And that's sort of this dichotomy between natural and unnatural, and this fear that somehow we're going to unsettle or upset some kind of natural order and that the consequences of that will be disastrous. So um, some of the things I'm thinking about, you know, sort of what is nature, there's the sort of unadulterated natural world, there's the idea of natural food, hopefully from some kind of small organic farm in upstate New York somewhere. Um, there's maybe some things about the natural world that we don't like so much killing and savagery, um, mosquitoes, uh, malaria, um, genetic conditions like sickle cell anemia, um, things like that. Um, and then there's this question of, you know, can anything that humans do be considered natural? So, you know, a city, is that unnatural or is that just our version of like a beaver dam or an, an anthill or something like that? Um, so these questions come up like I said, not just with CRISPR, but with all kinds of biotechnology. And I want to step back in time a minute, um, well, a number of years, uh, to the first generation of genetic engineering, which came up briefly in, in the Q&A with Ellen, uh, which was called recombinant DNA. Um, and I also have to apologize. My Ellen's graphics were awesome. Mine, I thank you to Google Images um, for having all this stuff that I pulled down in the last few days. Um, but so this recombinant DNA happened in the early 1970s, and it has a lot in common with CRISPR. Like Ellen explained, the big difference is that uh, you, know, you can't target any part of the genome. Um, but it, it, like CRISPR, was based on a natural bacterial immune system that people called uh, restriction enzymes. And so sort of like that Cas9 part of the thing that, that Ellen showed, it was a little molecule that could, could cut through DNA. But in this case, each one of these little restriction enzymes had a very specific target. So you couldn't send it anywhere, just each one would go to one place. There were a bunch of these uh, here, you know, and they had these very short little, those are all the, I mean, who cares, but all the names of the enzymes and the targeting sequences. Um, anyway, um, so that's similar that it came from this natural immune system. And another similarity is that it created a huge amount of controversy. Um, and in the scientific community, there was controversy within science, um, but it was a lot about safety uh, and this concern that maybe somehow they, they were doing a lot of experiments with this stuff in bacteria because it was easy to do in bacteria, a little harder to do in frogs and mammals and things like that. Um, and there was a concern that maybe they would accidentally turn a bacteria into something that was dangerous. And maybe they would do that to something like E. coli that lives inside of your gut, and they would turn that into a pathogen, and then it would get out of the lab and kill all kinds of people and be a huge problem. So that was debated seriously within the scientific community whether that was a real risk and how much of a risk it was and how to control it. Um, but outside of the scientific community, there was also a huge amount of controversy. And sort of safety was part of it, but the subtext was this, these bigger questions that, that I was just talking about. So um, I'm going to play a little clip here from these really amazing hearings that happened in Cambridge. Uh, where Harvard and MIT are in the mid-70s. And there was this mayor named Alfred Vellucci, who was kind of a outrageous working class mayor who um, had, had a, I think, a sixth grade education and was kind of always had a chip on his shoulder about 
these elite institutions kind of, you know, doing whatever they wanted. And so he seized on this as his sort of issue of the moment. Um, and here's a little clip of the hearing. Is it true that in the history of science, mistakes have been made to known to happen? Question. Do scientists ever exercise poor judgment? Question. Do they ever have accidents? Question. Do you possess enough foresight and wisdom to decide which direction the future of mankind should take? Question. The great war poet Joyce Kilmer once wrote, poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. I have made references to Frankenstein over the past week, and some people think this is all a big joke. That was my way of describing what happens when genes are put together in a new way. So you hear all that stuff about God and nature and Frankenstein and, and that kind of stuff that gives you a sense of the kinds of things people were worried about beyond safety. Um, and it wasn't just, I mean, this guy was this working class mayor, but there were also scientists who shared these kinds of concerns. So. Um, this is a quote from a very important um, biologist named Erwin Shargaff, who did some important groundwork leading up to Watson and Crick figuring out the structure of DNA. Um, and he says, my generation has been the first to engage in a destructive colonial warfare against nature. The future will curse us for it. So this was very much in the air. Um, and now I want to step back in time a little bit more uh, and, and go back to that quote that I had up at the beginning and, and include a little bit more of it. This quote is from this really fascinating essay that I came across in my research, written by this geneticist named J.B.S. Haldane, who was around, it was very prominent in the first half of the 20th century before genetics meant DNA, because they didn't really know about DNA. Um, and he wrote, this is, uh, this is what he looked like, and he wrote this, this essay called Daedalus um, in 1923, and it was a fairly big deal. It sold thousands of copies, and he made this argument, kind of like actually something Ellen said reminded me of it, that despite all the excitement around what was going on in physics and chemistry, that biology was going to be where some of the most exciting and transformative technologies came from. And the name was based on Daedalus, this figure from Greek mythology who had a role in creating the Minotaur, the you know half man, half bull. Um, and some people called this essay Daedalus the first transhumanist text um, because he was basically looking into the future and thinking, you know, where is this going to go? Um, and he envisioned. Uh, he says, we can already alter animal species to an enormous extent, and it seems only a question of time before we shall be able to apply the same principles to our own. Um, and he envisioned something he called ectogenesis, which is basically in vitro fertilization, you know, but like 50 years before that happened. Um, and he envisioned using genetic selection to kind of perfect the species. Um, and he was colleagues with uh, another very famous geneticist named Julian Huxley, whose brother Aldous Huxley um, wrote a, a book you've probably heard of. Um, so Daedalus has a lot of interesting, I think very interesting take on this question of natural and unnatural. Um, and part of what's really interesting is it sort of challenges you to, to broaden your idea of what biological technology or what he calls biological inventions are. So he lists uh, a bunch of them that existed at that time going all the way back to uh, the domestication of plants and animals, uh, using mic microbes to make beer and cheese and bread, um, uh, antibiotics and birth control, which were just kind of coming into to being a thing at that time. Um, and I want to dive a little bit into one of those, which is agriculture. So here is a 
beautiful golden ear of corn. Um, I came across this great quote. Uh, so when the Europeans came to the Americas, they were super excited about corn. Um, and it was brand new to them. And one thing, they, they, there was this quote from Columbus who said, uh, the grains were affixed by nature in a wondrous manner, um, the little kernels of corn. But of course, corn uh, did not come entirely from nature. It was domesticated about nine or 10,000 years ago in Mexico. And what's really cool about uh, modern genetics is they can look at the DNA sequence of corn and kind of figure out what the ancestor was. And it turns out it was this tiny wild grass called Teosinte. So, um, and here's a comparison of the size. Uh, and those little tiny kernels turned into these dozens and dozens of kernels on modern corn. Um, and looking at this really makes me think, you know, were there kind of anti-agriculture activists in 10,000 years ago saying, whoa, slow down there. What are you doing to our Teosinte plant? <laughs> um, another great example is all of these, which actually, so kohlrabi, kale, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and cauliflower all come from the same uh, ancestor, some kind of wild cabbage plant, so they were just selected for different traits, flowers or roots or stems or leaves. Um, and again, like if you really think about what they came from, they all sort of look like Frankenstein foods. Um, and you know, a lot of these domesticated plants can no longer grow in the wild, so we've actually interfered with their reproductive process, which definitely, you could argue, is a sort of a perversion. Um, on the other hand, if you look at it from the perspective of the plant, they've maybe domesticated us and gotten us to do a ton of work to spread their seeds all over the planet <laughs> and make them uh, some, of the, some of the most populous species on Earth. So, um, and then there's my favorite uh, thing from this Haldane essay, which is his, his point of view on milk. I'll let you just read it. So farming is really interesting because it's been around for so long and in some ways has become so essential to modern civilization that we've come to think of it as almost indistinguishable from nature. Um, you know, it not only transformed the planet in terms of how much land we're using to grow crops, but it also enabled much bigger human populations and settlements and changed all kinds of stuff. Um, and Haldane kind of pointed out that this was a technology as a way of saying, hey, maybe this other stuff down the road after a long time could that seems so weird now, things like CRISPR, you know, even though it didn't exist then, um, might one day become natural in the same way. Um, and so he had this, this idea kind of building on this idea that the, the biological invention is a perversion that after time it ends up as a ritual supported by unquestioned beliefs and prejudices. Um, and you can certainly see that with agriculture. You can also see that with, to some extent, something like recombinant DNA, um, which caused all this controversy in the 70s but also launched um, a new way of making insulin that is now essential to uh, pretty much, you know, most of the diabetics in the world use that. Um, on the other hand, you know, it also started the sort of anti-GMO movement that certainly hasn't died down. Um, another example is IVF, in vitro fertilization, which there was tons of controversy about in the 70s and 80s when it started. And now, I, I believe I read recently that something like 5% of all births in the US are through IVF. So, and no one's really running around saying we shouldn't have IVF anymore. So again, this kind of leads to this bigger question of where might we go with CRISPR? And certainly, this is a 
a tweet I came across from a geneticist named Daniel MacArthur, who works at the Broad Institute where some of the big original CRISPR work was done, predicting that in the future, uh, gene editing with CRISPR will be like a vaccine and it, it won't change what it means to be human. It'll just be seen as normal. So uh, I wish I could wrap up with a big thought about what we should make of all this, but I'm, uh, I'm still thinking through it myself. But I did want to add one kind of, with all this stuff kind of going in the direction of maybe this is going to seem normal, um, I wanted to just include one last thing from the other side. Uh, going back to this guy, Erwin Shargaff, who uh, was very worried about this stuff in the 70s. And this is another thing that he said. Uh, Have we the right to counteract irreversibly the evolutionary wisdom of millions of years in order to satisfy the ambition and the curiosity of a few scientists? I don't know that I would argue that the reason is that we're embarking on this CRISPR thing is just for the curiosity of a few scientists, but uh, I am really interested in this idea of evolutionary wisdom. And is there any, you know, what's the truth to that? Um, because evolution, of course, is a random process that takes place over, uh, you know, millions and billions of years. So I want to go back to just wrap up to this um, example of sickle cell anemia, um, which is caused by a single gene variant. Um, and if you have two copies of that gene, you have sickle cell anemia, um, which is a devastating disease. If you have one copy, they've found that you have a uh, resistance to malaria. Um, and the thinking is that that's the reason that this disease has stayed in the human population for so long and spread so widely. Um, is that, you know, one copy is good and two copies is bad. So there's kind of this balance. Um, and that says something to me. I don't know quite how to sum it up. <laughs> but, you know, something that um, as we proceed with this, we should proceed cautiously. And that I don't know that the difference between natural and unnatural is a good way to decide what's right and wrong. But I think the big thing that maybe defines things that humans do is that we do them with intention. Um, and we do them with motives and with an end in mind. Um, and we have the capability to do them with caution and with uh, forethought and you know, potentially with wisdom. Um, and so hopefully those are some of the values that we'll all think about and try to bring to CRISPR and whatever comes after CRISPR going forward. Yeah. I definitely don't have a one-liner, no. I mean, I'll tell you my, I think about this a lot, and I, as um, they mentioned in the intro, I worked on this series about climate change, and there was this really interesting interview that was part of that series that we did with a uh, this Republican, freshman Republican congressman who was sort of new enough to politics to, to sort of not know what not to say. And they got him to sit down and talk about his views on climate change. And of course, he was officially saying that this isn't real and the science is you know, still up for dispute and all the typical stuff. Um, but somehow they kind of got him in this back and forth. And he basically said, well, even if the science were true, I couldn't support it because it'll justify new environmental regulations and it'll lead to bigger government and all this stuff. And to me, it sort of revealed how, you know, at least for some people who are opposing 
you know, denying the science of climate change, that um, it is, is consciously just a sort of a smokescreen for a, a political agenda that is, you know, you could debate the politics of how government should regulate the environment, but they instead find it easier to make it about the science. So I think there's something similar going on, like a sort of parallel thing on the left about GMOs, which is that there's a lot of concern about corporate control of the food supply and profiteering and what's going on in developing countries and all this stuff um, and how research is funded. There's like tons and tons of legitimate issues to discuss, but the science is sort of the easiest place to, um, you know, kind of scare people and to, to bring up this stuff about, you know, kind of the Frankenstein idea is just so potent. So that's not a one line, but <laughs> that, those are my thoughts on that, yeah. Other questions? So back, I was going to piggyback on your question. So about, it, GMO keeps coming up in terms of food. I, my understanding was that it was really about the Roundup and the fertilizers that are used to create and what people consider the future of food. And whatever, you know, and right. yes, and everyone focuses on corn, but I'm just wondering why um, the GMO as food is a topic so much tonight when there's so much really more about like the physical aspect of it rather than the genetic, genetic aspect. aspect of it. And I don't, I, I'm not phrasing this very well, but I feel like that conversation has kind of been um, split in two in the past like, year or two, where everyone is like, oh, I, oh, I didn't realize they're not bad. It's, like chemicals, it's the chemicals. And involved. I may be wrong, but if we have more time, it would be great to hear a little bit more about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not like a, you know, GMO expert. Um, I just know... I mean, it's basically the same thing that people say about climate change, where they say, oh, well, 99% of the scientists agree that blah, 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 you could say about GMOs. And all these people who work on CRISPR and do basic research on genetics and have nothing to do with agriculture at all. You know, they're like studying some weird microorganism that grows in like a salt pond in Spain or something. Um, but they're, you know, they're like, yeah, I just, I don't know why the public is so worried about this, like genes, there's nothing like inherently good or bad about a specific gene and moving a gene around isn't inherently dangerous, so it's all about what you're doing and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think it's just maybe for a long time it's just been easier. I also think um, there's no benefit to the public of most GMOs. It's, you know, if anything, it's maybe beneficial to farmers and even that is disputed. I don't know enough to kind of have a horse in that race or whatever, but, um, you know, the, like a, a great, I mean, maybe this is the one liner, which is that um, no one has a problem with GMOs when it's GMO insulin that's you know s saving their kid with diabetes, um, so that at least kind of gets to the the issue of the genetic part of it somehow being inherently bad, and um, and I think that's part of it is like you know for someone who's just buying groceries at the grocery store, I don't think GMOs have made their food taste better, cheaper, you know anything. So there's no reason to like it and it's pretty easy to get caught up in the yeah, sort of the Frankenstein like stuff. Like more robust nutritional value, but... Sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, type of one more if there is one. Yeah. You might be moving about CRISPR. Do you have a sense of how close you are to CRISPR? Um, it's a ways. I mean, we're kind of, I mean, yeah, we're starting the filming process. We're maybe... I'd say we're probably like a year away. Yeah. Why do you ask? <laughs> uh, I look forward to seeing you. Oh, thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks, thank everyone. You.